Live from KSAT 12, the night beat starts right now. We are continuing to follow President Donald Trump's recovery tonight following his recent COVID-19 diagnosis. A press briefing outside Walter Reed Medical Center brought more confusion as the president's medical team attempted to clear up conflicting reports from his chief of staff on his health, saying yesterday the next 48 hours would be critical. We'll have the latest on the president's activities today coming up in just a bit. But first, it has been called a life-saving antiviral drug and it is just one of the medications President, Trump doc President Trump's doctors are using to help him recover from COVID-19. Remdesivir stops the virus from multiplying and has been shown to help patients recover faster. The president received his first dose yesterday as part of a five-day treatment. The night team Stephen Cavasso spoke to a local doctor who is leading the world's largest remdesivir study right here in San Antonio. Days after President Donald Trump revealed he and First Lady Melania Trump tested positive for COVID-19, questions have mounted over the president's treatment. As the president recovers at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center, White House officials say he was injected with an experimental antibody cocktail and yesterday began receiving the antiviral drug remdesivir. I think patients like the president admitted to a hospital. Those patients were one who really benefited most. Dr. Thomas Patterson with UT Health San Antonio has been leading a local study site for clinical trials of remdesivir at University Hospital since March. He says hospitalized COVID patients who have needed oxygen benefit the most from the antiviral drug. According to the president's medical team, he has been given supplemental oxygen twice since becoming ill. Patterson says that means the president meets the criteria where remdesivir could be helpful. Those would have been parameters that would suggest that, in fact, he would have benefited, and hopefully he will. But Patterson says patients who require an extensive amount of oxygen don't benefit as much. He says remdesivir can cause liver function abnormalities, but most symptoms are limited to nausea, constipation, or diarrhea. Really few patients having to get the drug discontinued because of side effects. Despite questions surrounding the president's treatment, Patterson says health officials are working to find the right answer. We're learning a lot in this disease still, and we would like to know the best path forward. Now, again, remdesivir is just one of the treatments that the president is being treated with. Others include a combination of drugs, antibody therapy, and supplements, including zinc, vitamin D, and aspirin. Now, White House physician Dr. Sean Conley says that the president's health has improved since the beginning of his treatment, and he could be discharged as early as tomorrow. We're live tonight, Stephen Cavasso's KSAT 12 News. Tim, Courtney. Thank you, Stephen. Shifting now to how the coronavirus is affecting us here in Bear County. It is Sunday, which means we are seeing another jump in COVID-19 case numbers thanks to backlogged additions. Metro Health officials are reporting 113 new cases tonight and 381 backlogged cases. No new deaths were reported today, but 24 backlog deaths have been reported between the dates of July 12th and September 17th. As for hospitalizations tonight, there are 200 being treated locally with 80 in the ICU and 30 on ventilators. And new on the night beat, one of the latest local COVID-19 patients, Cornerstone Church Pastor John Hagee. Church leaders announced Pastor Hagee's diagnosis during their online service this afternoon. Matt Hagee, the pastor's son, told the congregation his father found out about his positive test on Friday. He said it was discovered early and his father is now on the mend. During the service, Matt Hagee asked the church to pray for his father and everyone else who is currently battling the illness. Turning now to other top stories we've been following today, San Antonio police say a man riding a motorcycle was hospitalized after running a red light and hitting a vehicle. It happened shortly after 3 o'clock this afternoon near Cincinnati Avenue and North Trinity Street. Officers on scene told us a man in his late 40s was headed west on Cincinnati when he ran the light and collided with a car that was turning. We're told another vehicle was also involved, but it's really not clear what to to what extent that car was involved. The motorcyclist was the only one injured and we're told he was not wearing a helmet. At last check, he was in stable condition. No word on any charges. A child has been hospitalized in serious condition following a head on collision on the southwest side. The crash happened just before 4 a.m. at the intersection of Stony Brook and Mary Oaks Drive. Police say the child's father fell asleep at the wheel and hit another vehicle while turning left onto Stony Brook. The child suffered a head injury and was taken to University Hospital. No other injuries were reported, but the child's father was arrested and now faces a DWI charge with a child passenger. 
Police say they are still looking for a suspect wanted in connection with an overnight stabbing. This happened around 1030 last night near I-35 and Ritterman Road in the parking lot of a Shell gas station. When officers got there, they found a man lying by a car wash with what police described as a deep cut to the abdomen. He was taken to the hospital in serious condition. The Carmel County Sheriff's Office asking for help finding this man on your screen, 65-year-old New Braunfels resident Stephen Allen Klatt. They say Klatt was last seen September 29th, heading to a potential job site in the Austin or Buda area. Klatt was wearing a royal blue t-shirt, dark tan canvas overalls, and work boots. According to the Sheriff's Office, Klatt was also driving a white Ford double cab diesel flatbed truck with a plate that reads JGF. 2072. If you have any information on his whereabouts, contact the Comal County Sheriff's Office at 830-620-3400. Stories making headlines around Texas. The birthday of soldier Vanessa Guillen was celebrated with a march today. She would have turned 21 this week. Family members who were at the event say it's been five months since her passing. And they're still waiting for justice. Guillen disappeared in April at Fort Hood. Her remains were later found in a shallow grave about 20 miles east of Fort Hood. One of her murder suspects fatally shot himself after being identified as a suspect. The other suspect is in custody and charged in connection with Guillen's death. Happening this week on KSAT 12, we will be hosting a debate between the candidates for Texas Congressional District 23. The winner will repra replace Representative Will Hurd. Democrat Gina Ortiz Jones is running against Republican Tony Gonzalez. The debate is scheduled for this Thursday, October 8th at 7 p.m. And we want to hear what questions you have for both of these candidates. Just head to KSAT.com and look on the homepage to submit your questions. Outside with live cam, we've got a few clouds out there. Hard to tell on this view, but uh, just a few clouds out there this evening. Otherwise, very comfortable. Temperatures are in the upper 70s, our dew points for a lot of us, upper 50s, low 60s. So it's not feeling overly humid just yet. Really comfortable out there this evening. It got pretty toasty this afternoon. High temperatures jumped into the upper 80s, low 90s, up to 93 in Catula, 90 here in the Alamo City, 89 up in Kerrville. Believe it or not, temperatures are going to take a pretty big tumble overnight. We're looking at out the door temperatures tomorrow morning, getting everyone out the door ready for work and school in the upper 50s and low 60s. So a cool start to the day tomorrow, but we are looking at a stretch of warm afternoons all week long. We'll talk about what you can expect this week and also what's going on in the tropics. Things are getting busy out in the Gulf and in the Caribbean. All that coming up in just a little bit. Tim. Thanks, Katie. We'll see you in just a bit. If you're a veteran or active military, you are getting a special thank you from businesses participating in Freedom Day this Thursday, October 8th. One local dentist is shutting down his practice for the entire day to offer free services. Alicia Barrera found out why it's important for him to give back to those who served our country. A special thank you is underway to our military. The first Freedom Day event took place more than seven years ago and continues to expand with the idea to provide free services, products, and goods to our troops. This year, Restoration Dental on the city's northwest side is joining the thank you movement for the first time. You'll come in as a patient, we'll take our radiographs, uh, we'll do an evaluation to see what type of cleaning you may need, and then we'll provide that cleaning for you. And then if you need any fillings or extractions or emergency base, and depending on time, uh, we'll try to do as much as we can for you within the means of the time allotted. Good morning, Megan. Nice to meet you. Restoration Dental was one of many businesses forced to shut down due to COVID-19 precautions. They've since opened back up, and although the revenue is needed, Dr. Kai Mallerney says closing to the public this coming Thursday is well worth it. Well, being that we're in San Antonio and the community has really kind of invested in us, we want to give back. That's all it really comes down to. I mean, these members, men and women, do this on a daily. I think we can sacrifice one day. Dental services will be offered to veterans in the active military as well as their spouses and children. Plus, they'll be giving out prizes. This is our first time, but we're really excited to do it, so we're making an event out of it. We'll have a food truck from 12 to 2. Um, we're going to be giving away door prizes like an Apple iWatch um, and other good things. For details on how to make an appointment for the free dental service, head over to our website at ksat.com.
Well, it was a once empty parking lot now full of people today receiving a free barbecue meal. More than 600 meals were given out today at the empty lot off Broadway north of downtown near the San Antonio Zoo. The Smoke Rain King provided that food. It was organized by a local business owner, Shonda Robledo, who says people can expect much more from that lot. A community farmer's market that will have a community cafe every Wednesday. We'll have a community fridge. So when people are, people are hungry and they just need something, a community pantry, and we'll have events weekly. The first farmer's market is planned for October 15th. We are exactly one month away from the 2020 election. How President Trump's COVID-19 diagnosis affects both his and Joe Biden's campaign. Plus, one Converse man is the source of entertainment for his entire neighborhood. It's all because of his love for small model aircrafts. We'll explain more in this week's What's Up South Texas segment. And following more mixed messaging from his medical team today, President Donald Trump taking a ride in his motorcade in an effort to reassure Americans he is recovering. The latest next. Tonight, President Trump making a surprise visit to supporters outside of the hospital where he is being treated for COVID-19. This is many call for transparency from the White House and Trump's medical team with contradicting statements about the president's condition and the details of his diagnosis. ABC's Rena Roy has the latest from Washington. In a surprise move tonight, the president leaving Walter Reed Medical Center in the midst of battling COVID-19 to wave hello to supporters, posting this video on Twitter moments before. I also think we're going to pay a little surprise to some of the great patriots that we have out on the street. A senior administration official tells ABC News he then went back to the military hospital to continue treatment. In that video and seven months into the pandemic, President Trump saying he's now learned a lot about the virus. And I get it and I understand it and it's a very interesting thing, and I'm going to be letting you know about it. Tonight, ABC News is learning from multiple sources familiar with the matter that President Trump had already tested positive with a rapid test before phoning into Sean Hannity's show on Fox News Thursday evening. At that time, only revealing that top aide Hope Hicks had contracted the virus. I just heard about this. She tested positive. Those sources saying he was waiting to reveal his results from a more accurate PCR test. Meantime, his medical team insisting he's doing well with no fever since Friday morning as he receives doses of the experimental drug remdesivir and a steroid dexamethasone. ABC chief medical correspondent Dr. Jen Ashton. This is the only drug that has been shown to have a survival benefit in clinical trials, but it also indicates indicates that the president's disease is not considered mild. The American people getting mixed messages about the president's condition, the timeline of his diagnosis, and how he may have been infected. Saturday, his leading physician, Dr. Sean Conley, appearing to dodge questions over whether the president received any supplemental oxygen. Today, he said this. The president has experienced two episodes of transient drops in his oxygen saturation. I recommended the president we try some supplemental oxygen. Stayed on that for about an hour. Dr. Conley says that happened Friday, but when asked Probably if the president was also on oxygen time. Saturday, he couldn't seem to recall and was then pressed about his discrepancies. I was trying to reflect the, the, uh, the upbeat attitude that the team, the president, that his course of illness has had came off. Uh, that we were trying to hide something, which wasn't necessarily true. Adding to the confusion, White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows warned Trump's vitals, quote, over the last 24 hours were very concerning, cautioning the next 48 hours will be critical in terms of his care, contradicting what his doctors have said. Dr. Conley saying Meadows' comments were misconstrued. Rena Roy, ABC News, Washington. Every week on our digital program, KSAT Explains, we try to bring more context and perspective to the stories we bring you throughout the day in our newscasts. Well, this week, Sarah Spivey and I are taking the reins to discuss wildfires, hurricanes, and how they tie into climate change. Here's Myra Arthur with a preview. Wildfires burning in the West and an extremely active hurricane season. 
These two weather phenomena have become politically charged. Conversations about both have turned to conversations about climate change. Is it possible that it's also forest management and climate change? It's both things well, at the I same think time. something's possible. I think a lot of things are possible. But when you have years of leaves, dried leaves on the ground, it just sets it up. It's really a fuel for a fire. The damage from climate change is already here. So what role has climate change played in the fires and this hurricane season? And what could these weather events look like in the next few decades? Well, speaking of those hurricanes, I mean, yeah. we still have a lot of activity, but it's not, we're not feeling it right now. Our weather's pretty amazing. Yeah, still a lot of time left with the yeah. hurricane season out there, Katie. Oh my gosh, yes. And we had a, a little lull last week uh, in the tropics, and now things are starting to pick back up again. And we've got a couple of systems in the Caribbean and Gulf, so a little closer to home, but we don't expect either of these systems to impact our weather here in South Texas, and really neither should be a threat to the Texas coastline. So let's get into it. We've got Tropical Storm Gamma. If you'll recall, we are in the Greek alphabet now. So Tropical Storm Gamma winds of 60 miles per hour. Movement is very slow. The system is moving east at just two miles per hour. And over the next several days, movement is going to stay slow. Uh, this is a pretty messy track here. What you're seeing is this red line here. The system is going to drop down near the Bay of Campeche in the Yucatan Peninsula and then turn back off to the north by the middle of the week. That's next Thursday, 7 p.m there. So some slow movement to gamma over the next couple of days. The system that looks like it has a better chance of having some impacts to the U.S. coastline is Tropical Depression 26. So this does not have a name yet, but that is expected to happen late tonight sometime tomorrow. This would be Tropical Storm Delta. So gamma over in uh, the Gulf and Delta in the Caribbean. So this system will continue to pace through the Caribbean Monday by Tuesday. It could be a category one hurricane as it moves into the Gulf of Mexico. And this is the latest track from the Hurricane Center. Uh, they have Delta as a category two hurricane Thursday evening as it's approaching the central Gulf Coast. So anywhere essentially from far east Texas through Louisiana into Mississippi and Alabama. Even the Florida Panhandle needs to keep an eye on this system because essentially anywhere in this cone here, that center of circulation could go. So we are still several days from knowing what part of the Gulf Coast that system could affect. Um, but if you'll notice here when I kind of lay out both of the tracks of these systems as they get into the western Gulf closer to the Texas coastline. They kind of pump the brakes and then take a turn off to the north. Why is that and why are we not really concerned about these systems impacting the Texas coast at this time? Well, it all has to do with the steering flow and the mid and upper levels of the atmosphere. So we've got a nice what we call a trough here, a piece of upper level energy that has dropped down into Texas, northern Mexico, and will sit there for the next couple of days. Winds around this area are going counterclockwise. Then we've got a high pressure system over near Florida. Winds around that system are going clockwise. So essentially what's happening is these two tropical systems are kind of getting pushed in the middle here, and that's why they're being steered into the central Gulf of Mexico and away from the Texas coastline. So that's our setup heading into the next couple of days. And that's why, again, we're not expecting any impacts to the Texas coast from those tropical systems. But of course, we'll continue to keep you updated over the next couple of days. So while other parts of the Gulf Coast prep for maybe some tropical mischief later this week, we've got pretty quiet weather here at home. Cool mornings, upper 50s, low 60s, warm afternoons, but pretty manageable humidity all week long. So it's not gonna feel overly hot and humid out there this week. Right now we're at 78. Airport is reading some clouds, but we're going to see any clouds that are out there now clear out overnight. Our dew point is sitting pretty nicely in the upper 50s. Elsewhere, 75 in Catula, 77 in Del Rio, and everyone really has some pretty manageable dew points tonight. Uh, we'll, overnight, we'll see again skies generally clear out. So through early tomorrow morning, skies becoming clear. We'll start you off in the upper 50s, so cool, but nice and warm tomorrow afternoon. High temperatures back in the mid to upper 80s and we've got a warm week ahead. But again, with that humidity staying in check, it's not going to feel too terribly bad out there this week. Guys, that makes such a big difference, the humidity. I will take it. We'll be right back. Stay with us. 
The Dallas Cowboys attempted greatest comeback comes up short against the Cleveland Browns with more of what's on instant replay. Let's check in with our Greg. Yeah, the emphasis attempted because <laughs> what if you're Dak, you know, yeah. 500 plus yards, four touchdowns. What, what else can he do? And the Houston Texans have kicked off 2020 zero and four coming up tonight on a brand new edition of instant replay. Come on, man, please. I feel worse than this. I'm tired of it. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. All right, Dak is at the podium. Yeah, the frustration is starting to show. Dak Prescott throws for over 500 yards and four touchdowns as the Cowboys scored 24 unanswered points, including three straight two-point conversions in the fourth quarter and still come up short against the Cleveland Browns. Being one and three is not sitting well with Dak in Dallas. Uh, we obviously have to do something different. Uh, we are on four. Whatever we're doing is not working. Something needs to change. Something needs to be different. Even worse, the Texans have fallen to 0-4 to start 2020 season after coming up short against the Minnesota Vikings, who scored their first win of the season today. And despite the fact that Sean Watson threw for 300 yards and two touchdowns, would have been three, but a controversial call erased it. And who had the best play, the best run, the best catch? We will show you in the best of big game coverage and a new number one team in 12's top 12. Who's moving up and who's moving out? All that plus should the Texans fire Bill O'Brien as a head coach and general manager. Tonight, you decide. Instant Replay is live and it's next. And remember, he gave up all the draft picks. So even if they do poorly, their first and second rounders go to Miami. Wow. Yeah, wow. Lots to talk about tonight. Thanks, <laughs> okay. Greg. Sure. Still to come on the night beat as the presidential campaign enters its final month. It has been totally upended by the president's COVID-19 diagnosis. How both candidates are reimagining their campaigns and reaching out to voters. Next. President Trump's COVID-19 diagnosis upending the strategy for both his and Biden's campaigns. Yeah, the president not attending his signature in-person rallies at this time and Joe Biden's campaign promising transparency with his COVID-19 test results. Here's ABC's Andrew Dimbert with the details. President Trump's coronavirus diagnosis has dramatically upended the strategy for both campaigns with just 30 days until the election. Large in-person rallies with the president have been put on hold for now, but his campaign launching a Trump re-election bus tour this weekend as scheduled with top surrogates gathering indoors, few wearing masks. A new ABC News Ipsos poll shows nearly three out of four Americans say the president didn't take the risk of getting COVID seriously enough and didn't take the appropriate precautions when it came to his personal health, his campaign pushing back. We take it very seriously. It's why we give everyone coming to rallies or to events. We give them a mask. We check their temperature. Joe Biden's campaign has pulled negative ads about the president following news of his COVID diagnosis. In a new statement, his campaign promising to release the results of every COVID-19 test Biden takes, saying the former vice president has led by example. The coronavirus has overtaken every corner of American life. It has made it so that we cannot send our kids to school. It's shuttering our small businesses. It's keeping us from being able to see our families and our friends. Americans are worried. They look to Joe Biden. They say leadership. It's now unclear if the second presidential debate, a town hall format set for October 15th in Miami, will go on as planned. But the candidates running mates are gearing up for their own debate Wednesday night. Sources tell ABC News Senator Kamala Harris and Vice President Mike Pence will sit 12 feet apart after the Biden campaign requested more space during their debate. Andrew Dimbert, ABC News, Washington, D.C. Well, at least 21 states have a higher number of new COVID-19 cases than they did a week ago. That's according to data from Johns Hopkins University, which shows only three U.S. states reporting a decline in new cases. As of last night, new cases were down here in Texas, in Missouri, and in South Carolina. Researchers at the University of Washington are now predicting as many as 2,900 deaths a day in December and projecting 363,000 U.S. deaths by the end of the year. Another victim of the coronavirus pandemic, Regal Cinemas, could be temporarily shutting down theaters across the U.S. this week. Regal in July began reopening most of its 778 theaters worldwide after closing for several months during coronavirus lockdowns. But last month, the company reported a loss of more than one and a half billion dollars in the first half of 2020, with revenue tanking 67 percent. Regal is the second largest cinema chain in the United States following AMC with more than 500 theaters. The possible shutdown comes a day after the latest James Bond film No Time to Die was delayed until spring of next year.
And we are learning just how much of a toll wildfires have taken on the state of California this year. The state's fire agency says fires have burned more than 4 million acres so far. In an update today, Cal Fire says more than 16,000 firefighters are battling 23 major blazes in addition to several smaller fires. They say at least 31 people have died in this year's wildfires and about 100,000 people have had to evacuate their homes. More than 8,000 structures are in ashes, and California's wine country is decimated. The SCU and LNU Lightning Complex fires were some of the largest blazes in state history before firefighters were able to contain them. From fire to tropical storms, taking a look at Gamma, which made landfall on Mexico's Gulf Coast yesterday, we are getting a look at some of the damage today left behind in the storm's wake with strong winds and heavy rains. Gamma caused significant flooding and destruction in the Mexican states of Quintana Roo and Tabasco. As the storm moves north, authorities worry additional damage will likely occur. Yeah, Gamma is moving very slowly. Uh, speed as of the latest update from the Hurricane Center, just two miles per hour. So some of those regions that have seen a lot of heavy rains will likely have more rain in the forecast over the coming days as Gamma meanders slowly near the Yucatan Peninsula. That's the system here. But we've got another system, our newest tropical depression, sitting in the Central Caribbean, but it's got its sights set on the Gulf of Mexico as well. Another look at these tropical systems um, and where they could go over the next couple of days coming up in just a few minutes. Courtney. Thank you, Katie. Still ahead, a local man who spends his downtime flying his collection of model planes is encouraging others to join in on the fun. What's Up South Texas is next. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. All right, so some hobbies require a specialized set of skills, and one Converse man has acquired plenty of those during his many years flying airplanes. And no, we're not talking about commercial airplanes, but small model aircrafts he's collected over time. Yeah, in doing so, he's brought a unique entertainment to his neighbors. Bernard Williams is next on What's Up South Texas. The night team's Jeff D. Gray with how he is encouraging others to join the fun. You never forget how to fly, you know, it's kind of like getting on a bike. You remind me of Stevie Wonder. I am Stevie Wonder. If you're ever driving along Beach Trail in Converse, you may see this man, 56-year-old Bernard Williams, wearing his goggles and enjoying life right from his outside lawn chair, doing the very thing he loves, flying. Which is why when you look up, you may also see this little gadget soaring through the air. Yeah fall asleep flying, you know, but it's it's fun, you know, it's relaxing and and it's enjoyable. He's a warehouse worker for Amazon by day, but when he's off, he makes time for his hobby of flying different aircrafts. You can you get a brick and put some wings on it, throw a motor on it. I can fly that brick. I mean, I don't know how far it's going to fly, but I guarantee I can get it off the ground and I can fly that brick. Bernard started it all in the 80s when he bought his first plane to show off to his wife. Took it out, took it up and went up about maybe 400 feet. The loop came straight down. <laughs> Lots of pieces. She says, oh, I see you can fly all right. You can fly right to the ground. But he didn't give up on flying. Plane after plane, he perfected his craft to the point of helping others at different flying fields. Can you do this? Can you check this? And, you know, check it out and tell them, hey, look, plane, plane flies great. From the motor to the wings, he also builds planes like these from scratch. They're just wood, but you just got to know where to put everything. And he donates them to beginners. There's something else that they want to try. I would give them, I give them different planes, you know. With his garage wide open, filled with his large collection for all to see, Bernard welcomes any interested neighbor or plane enthusiast, including his neighbor, John, who comes by to fly with him often. End up spending six hours. We're just sitting around just talking. Before you know, it's like, oh. I gotta get home. <laughs> he hopes his passion of flying planes inspires others to take on the hobby as well. The factor that they're fearing is they don't wanna crash, but you're gonna crash. And just like in life, Bernard says, all you have to do is try and try again. That's Superfly for What's Up South Texas. Japhne Gray, KSAT 12 News. Very cool, I wanna be Bernard's neighbor too. Yeah, I was gonna say. For six hours. That looks like fun. <laughs>
Fighting fatigue with food. Coming up, a look at some foods that can help you stay alert and kick the stress to the curb.